Welcome to another edition of Horse Center, everyone. I am Brian Sipsy, and as always, I have the excellent pleasure of being joined by my co-host to the East Coast, that's Matt Shipman. How are you today, Matt? I am good, Brian. We got a show coming up. You said to take the gloves off for the first segment of the show. I'm ready. Taking the gloves off. Well, the first segment of the show, folks, as many of you already know, uh, We've had just nothing but controversy this week as the Kentucky Derby winner, Medina Spirit, tested positive. Uh, his drug test after the Kentucky Derby came back positive. Matt, this is unfortunately nothing new for his trainer. The trainer is the one who's, who's coming under the, uh, under the fire this week. His name is, of course, Bob Baffert. Dozens and dozens, Matt, of, uh, of positive tests over the year for Baffert. Uh, races, big races, like when Justify won the Santa Anita Derby, when uh, Charlottetown won the Arkansas Derby, when Kameen ran in the Kentucky Oaks, and now the Kentucky Derby. Matt, what do you make of all this? Um, well, I make lots of it, Brian, out of it, Brian, but, but I just want to start off by saying, you know, I, I, I'm tired of it. I'm tired that uh, Bob Baffert gets to go from uh, – being labeled the greatest trainer in the history of horse racing over and over again by so many people one week to the next week another drug violation and another set of stories about the drug violation the drug positive test that's happened the horses that have died in his barn uh, over the years so I, I, I'm growing tired of it something's got to change and I got a feeling that maybe something's going to change, that Mr. Baffert is going to have to face the fire, finally. I'm with you, Matt. Uh, hey, listen, uh, I've followed horse racing literally closely my entire life. I've been, I've been closer to horse racing than ever in the last 10, 15 years. And, and there are people you learn to have great respect for at the track. Uh, and often I'm talking about trainers because trainers are kind of the, the boss, the, you know, this, the, the head of the stable, the, uh, the, the ones that run things, uh, the ones that are in front of the cameras after the race. And there are a lot of great trainers out there. A lot of guys I have great respect for. And unfortunately, I've seen some leave. And I've seen uh, another one leave just recently because of wh why, why are they leaving? It's because of the direction of the game. And it's for things like this. Bob Baffert is not the only cheater. We saw uh, uh, just last year, uh, Jason Service and, uh, and, and uh, Jorge Navarro uh, uh, go down and, and to proven basically uh, I, I know the court case is still going on but the fbi uh brought wrangled them in and and said no more I, I think those guys were probably less dangerous than than some of the trainers out there now bob baffert certainly isn't the only one Matt, you know that but bob baffert is kind of the face of horse racing he says it uh and and then he uh he comes back with more positive tests in big races uh it doesn't stop and nor do the excuses and 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 the uh uh, his, uh, his media uh, onslaught this week uh, included some confounding excuses. And, and a lot of people see him as a hero because for all the big races he's won. But uh, I certainly don't. And I think it's time. It's, it's over time. It's past time that uh, uh, horse racing um, pulls up its pants, so to speak, and, and says, you know, we got to do something about this. And and maybe this Kentucky Derby embarrassment, because it's, it, it, it is in every possible imagine an embarrassment what's going on now. Uh, maybe this uh, kind of slaps the industry in the face a little bit and, and we can move forward from this. But hey, Bob Baffert's a guy who was suspended a year from quarter horse racing back in the day, a long time ago in, in thoroughbred horse racing. He has, uh, as I said before, dozens and dozens of positive tests and he always seems to kind of skate away from these things and, and, and be above them. Maybe not this time. Maybe not this time. And I think if anything is going to change, it's, it's not going to change uh, with the status quo. It's not going to change with all, because of all of his supporters that think he is the greatest trainer in the history of horse racing. And it's not going to change with the current structure uh, and regulating bodies. But it might change if 
owners that give him the best horses that are bred and purchased to win the big races stop doing that and and maybe it has begun with just the other day spendthrift farm yes the same spendthrift farm who uh stands authentic the winner of last year's kentucky derby the same spendthrift farm announced that they are taking uh five six horses away from baffert and sending them to other trainers to todd pletcher to richard mandela and to others other trainers who have large stables but in their histories have a very 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 rare drug positive record yeah and, and that uh, as far as baffert and baffert is the guy we're we're really talking about right now i said there are we know there are a lot of other guys out there that are cheating uh, but Baffert's the guy we're going after right now because Baffert just won the Kentucky Derby and Baffert has a long, long history. But you see the excuses that he comes up with over and over again if you follow other sports. Baseball was a great example with all the steroid use uh, that they had uh, uh, years ago. And, and, and guys used some of the exact same excuses Baffert's using. It was the cream. It was the ointment that, uh, that caused these positive tests. Uh, sooner or later... Uh, I, I think the line has to stop and, and, and maybe now it, it is a good time for it to finally stop. The FBI had to come in for service and Navarro. They were, uh, they were obvious. They, were, they, they weren't very smart about it. Uh, Baffert has been much more smart about it and his excuses to this point have, uh, have worked to a large extent. Why, do, why does he cheat in a race like the Kentucky Derby? Because he's been getting away with it for so long. Matt, I'm not going to bet this weekend. I'm not going to bet the Preakness. I'm not going to bet uh, the Black Eyed Susan and the Pimlico Special. I think some of them are, are good betting races, and I'm going to handicap them, and I'm going to offer my picks here uh, on Horse Racing Nation. That's what I'm paid to do, but uh, I will not be betting uh, any races that involve uh, the Preakness or Bob Backer this weekend. But we're going to give our opinion on these races. And of course, we're going to start with the middle jewel of the Triple Crown Mount. It's the Preakness. I see the first two horses uh, listed as favorites in the Preakness Mount are trained by Bob Baffert. Let's start with Medina Spirit, nine to five on the morning line. Sure, Kentucky Derby winner. Uh, um, and, and you have to go back and look at, uh, at Bob Baffert's record uh, with his Kentucky Derby winners that have gone on to run in the Preakness. He has had six of them. Five of them have come back to win. The only exception has been authentic last year in the, uh, in the modified COVID year triple crown. He's got a tremendous record for whatever reason. He has a tremendous record with these horses. Uh, they're in top form. They don't need any, uh, any workouts between the Derby uh, and the Preakness. They just need to keep their form. We know what works for Medina Spirit. When he goes to the lead, he wins the race. So I think that's what we got to expect again. Yeah, yeah, I, I would expect him to be uh, going for the lead under John Velasquez. And, and folks, uh, these two horses, Medina Spirit and Concert Tour, we're going to talk about in a second, are allowed to race in the Preakness. Uh, it would have been a uh, legal uh, brouhaha if they weren't allowed to race. I don't like it, but they're in here and they're the two favorites. Medina Spirit, I think, is beatable in here, Matt, in that he's speed and uh, he got his race in the Kentucky Derby. I, I don't think it's going to be quite as easy maybe from the other Baffert in, in concert tour has a lot of speed and is a very talented horse and they're different owners. They're not going to take concert tour out of the race to, uh, to let Medina spirit do his thing in here. Uh, I think Medina spirits a very beatable favorite. And I, I might even think that concert tour, the second choice on the morning line, that is the more uh, uh, scary proposition to me from the Baffert farm. Am I wrong? Um, I don't know, Brian. Um, it, it's hard to predict those kind of things, but you would think that Concert Tour uh, is going to want the lead also. That means that the two Bafferts are going to be out there ding-donging it uh, in the early going, and that's going to make it tough. Uh, uh, Concert Tour backed out of the lead in the Arkansas Derby in his prior start, uh, beaten by uh, Superstock and Caddo River. 
Um, and, and that certainly is not a positive in my eyes, but it sure looks like that those two are going to go at it. And, you know, it, it, the way horse races work, that in my eyes makes them vulnerable. Yeah, vulnerable. Mile three sixteenths with, uh, with a lot of speed going at each other. They are certainly beatable if you're betting this race. Concert Tour looked really good in the Revel, which was his first start around two turns. And then he didn't look so good in the Arkansas Derby when uh, Caddo River took the lead away from him early. So we'll have to see how he bounces back. I think he might come back with an improved effort off that in Arkansas Derby. But again, Matt and I are thinking Medina Spirit Concert Tour could uh, make this pace a much tougher pace than we saw in the Kentucky Derby. One horse who also should show more speed than he did in the Kentucky Derby, not necessarily but by design, uh, by the, but the mere fact that he just didn't break well enough. And that's Midnight Bourbon, Matt. He's the third choice on the morning line. I think he has a very interesting jockey change as well, going from Mike Smith to Irad Ortiz Jr. Yeah, and, and uh, that certainly is interesting. It's a, it's a jockey change that I like because uh, Midnight Bourbon is likely to, in this 10-horse field, get into that stalking position just behind the pace, which is his preferred running style. In the 20-horse derby field, Midnight Bourbon was just not able to do that, you know, ended up mid-pack or mid-pack to the back of the early going and then picked up some horses and finished sixth uh, in the derby. But uh, with Irad Ortiz on board, arguably the hottest jockey in the country, right now or one of the two hottest jockeys in the country right now uh, um i read loves to ride from that kind of position yeah I, I agree with you matt i think midnight bourbon could sit a very good trip in here it'll it'll depend upon a little bit what medina spirit and concert tour do especially if they're kind of going at it a little bit midnight bourbon can sit third and i read ortiz you're right as a master at winning races like this. Midnight Bourbon, a son of Tiz now, trained by Steve Asmussen, has plenty of good stakes experience. His sixth in the Kentucky Derby was uh, uh, certainly better than it looks on paper when you consider he's a horse who wants to be out there. He had no chance to be out there uh, early after the break in the Derby, and he ran on well to finish sixth in that Derby. So Midnight Bourbon seems like a very logical candidate to beat the two Bafford favorites. Fourth choice on the morning line, Matt, is Crowded Trade. And Crowded Trade is a very uh, lightly raced uh, uh, horse out of the Chad Brown barn, Matt. I, I, I'm on record saying that I didn't think the Wood Memorial was a great prep, far from it. But on the other hand, I, I find myself very interested in this horse a little bit in the Preakness. I think he's a horse with potential, but, but as you were referencing, Brian, uh, I'm just not comfortable with the way those uh, New York horses performed in the Derby. I know this Preakness is a, it's a different thing. It's only 10 horses and such. Um, uh, but uh, this Chad Brown runner, I think, uh, uh, needs to get some more experience. Does he have a chance to hit the board? I think, yeah, he's got a chance to hit the board, but I don't like him as a, as a win contender. Yeah, and I like him. I like him more than that. Uh, I, you know, Chad Brown is is a master at uh, at winning races with lightly raced horses or horses without of a lot of experience. He gets horses ready for big races. Crowded trade. I tell you what, looking at that Gotham, that Gotham got some really good speed figures, and that was his second lifetime race where he had just a month earlier run six furlongs, a six furlong maiden race where he rallied to win that. The Gotham, he went tooth and nail down the stretch uh, in, in a pretty fast edition of the Gotham. That was his second lifetime start. I think that's a big performance, and that's a performance that tells me he's a talented horse. I think he bounced a little bit in the Wood Memorial. Still, he was good enough to be beaten just over a length while third. He was still running in the stretch. People say, well, maybe he's not finishing off these races. I, I think just a little bit of experience, and Chad Brown's the right guy to get a lightly raced horse ready for a big race. A little bit more experience, which is now under him after that word memorial. I think crowded trade is a very interesting long shot in this race, Matt. Another interesting long shot could be from the ex Pletcher assistant, Mike McCarthy. He's got Ron Bauer. Ron Bauer's running a bunch of stakes races, Matt. His only stakes win, though, was not on the dirt. Is Ron Bauer ready to run a big race in the Preakness? 
I think Ron Bauer is a very interesting horse in this race. Uh, the son of Twirling Candy, as he said, got that win on in the El Camino Real Derby at Golden Gate Fields on their artificial surface. Um, it, it is important to note that along with that victory, he got a win in your in spot in the Preakness, and that was one of the main reasons that trainer Mike McCarthy opted not to go in the Kentucky Derby because, quite frankly, I heard him say, it's really expensive to, 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 to ship from the West Coast uh, to the East and, and uh, into a race like the Kentucky Derby. So he said, hey, I got a, I, I got a free entry into the Preakness. That's the way I'm going. Um, he was third in the Bluegrass. He has run some good races on the dirt. It's not, you know, it's not fair to just point at the El Camino Derby and say, hey, he's an artificial surface horse. Um, I think he's a horse that can run well on the dirt. I like the odds um, as a, a long shot pick. Yeah, Ron Bauer has a lot uh, of things I like as well, Matt, including the bluegrass. I think he didn't really get the pace setup that he wanted. He might get a much better pace setup. I do worry a little bit that, uh, yeah, I mean, I think the Kentucky Derby was a tougher spot and they picked the Preakness and they picked the Preakness with a win in your in. So why didn't they run in the Derby? It's cheaper, but maybe they were looking for an easier spot. They are getting an easier spot. Um, I worry that he, 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 despite being a late runner, that he's really not a 10 for a long horse. This is a mile three sixteenths. And if the speed sets up right, that might not be a problem, but uh, an interesting long shot uh, at the very least, as is unbridled honor, Matt, because this is a son of honor code who rallies every single time. He, he, he comes from way back. He's got no early speed. If he gets the pace set up, I think he's an interesting horse as well. Yeah, I agree. From the barn of Todd Pletcher and, and, and the interesting fact, Todd Pletcher has never won the Preakness. And, and yes, the Preakness has never been an important uh, uh, race in the scheduling for Todd Pletcher because with his derby horses, he will skip the Preakness and aim for the Belmont Stakes, of, uh, of course, unless, you know, he's won the derby um, and, and, and it w has to take a try at the Triple Crown, but he's got so many horses this year that are Belmont Stakes uh, potential. Unbridled Honor is one that, you know, he's taken a shot with um, in the Preakness and his last race, second in the uh, Lexington at Keeneland, uh, second behind King Fury, who got so much buzz uh, before he had to scratch uh, in front of the Derby. Right. And, and Unbridled Honor, you could see it in the past performances, Matt. Unbridled Honor, you know, it's been a slow process. He's only had, I believe, five races, but it's been a slow process. But you can see him literally getting better with each and every start. The Lexington was a good run. He was really running down the stretch with that sloppy addition of the Lexington. Uh, it, I tell you what, if anybody comes from the clouds to win the Preakness, I'm kind of leaning to him even more than Ron Bauer and keep me in mind, but uh, we'll have to see if he if he matches up with these horses from a class perspective. One horse who's had plenty of chances at this type of class is keep me in mind. He seemed like a better two-year-old than he's done at three. Uh, he did make up some ground in the Kentucky Derby, but on the other hand, he hasn't hit the board in all three of his starts this year. Yeah, Brian, I agree. A tale of two years with keep me in mind. Um, in as a two-year-old, he was competitive in every start and got a big win in, in uh, Kentucky Jockey Club at, towards the end of his two-year-old campaign. But this year, um, yes, he's been running in tough races, uh, the Rebel, the Bluegrass, the Derby, but uh, he has not been able to run uh, better than fifth. Yes, you know, he's a pace-dependent horse that runs from the back of the pack every time, but, um, just doesn't seem to be the same horse this year. Yeah, yeah, I, I kind of agree with that. On the other hand, it would shock me to see him come running and, and get into the exotics in here. But of the late runners, I do like Unbridled Honor and Ron Bauer just a little bit more. Another late runner is another Chad Brown horse. I think the horse I like more, Crowded Trade, is the more talented uh, entry from uh, uh, Chad Brown. But risk-taking is the Withers winner. Did it with a nice late run. 
uh, made it two straight wins at Aqueduct. But then the Wood Memorial, he really disappointed as the favorite. Yeah, that was a head scratcher for sure because uh, he'd gotten blinkers on, run two really big races at Aqueduct, was coming back on the same surface um, uh, uh, in the Wood Memorial. And everybody, including me, was expecting him to, you know, uh, 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 show his class and, and in the Wood Memorial. And he didn't, he didn't contend at all, finishing seventh in there. So it's hard for me to... Uh, expect uh you know a big bounce back in the preakness right and, and what i saw was uh withers that probably was a couple cuts below maybe the level of the gotham and the wood memorial so it kind of makes sense now looking back at it that he wasn't one of the main factors in that wood memorial i think this was kind of a, a late addition uh, a late decision to run him here in the preakness when we saw so many horses weren't running in the preakness I think the better Chad Brown is crowded trade. Uh, the next horse, Matt, who, who knows what to make of France Go de Ina, uh, an American bred through and through, a Japanese trained horse who won two straight last year in Japan, but he's only had one race this year and it was just okay. Yeah, Brian, uh, um, to me, should be the long shot in the, in the race, but he's only 20 to one morning line. I don't want any part of it. I don't either. And in fact, I think this is more of a prep for the Belmont and the bonus that might happen. Maybe he's a mile and a half horse and maybe he has a better shot in the Belmont. I expect the Belmont to be a tougher race, but I, I think this is almost a get used to American racing so you can make a better run in the Belmont for that one. Last horse on the list, Matt, is Ram. Ram took forever to break his maiden. Uh, he finally did it in maiden claiming. But last time he improved and he won an allowance race uh, Kentucky Derby weekend at Churchill Downs. Yeah, for uh, for the coach, D. Wayne Lucas, who has won the uh, Preakness a whole bunch of times and not that long ago in 2013 with uh, Oxbow, um, son of American Pharaoh. Uh, but yeah, this is a big step up, even in a, a Preakness that doesn't have the greatest field. 85-year-old uh, Dwayne Lucas up on the pony every morning. Boy, uh, he makes me feel old that being seeing him up on a, up on a pony in the morning at the track. Uh, uh, honestly, Brian, I hope he runs well. Yeah, and and I, I I can't really get behind this horse either, Matt. But uh, Dwayne Lucas, the first time he won the Preakness was a very controversial. Uh, win back in 19, uh, 1980 with uh, Codex beating the Philly Genuine Risk. Uh, he's won five Preaknesses. I, I think this is more kind of swinging for the fences with a horse that looks to be a little bit overmatched. All right, Matt, that's, uh, that's all 10 for the Preakness. Who's your top pick? Who's your long shot in this year's middle jewel? My top pick is uh, Midnight Bourbon to sit a stalking trip and, uh, and pick up the pieces down the stretch. And my long shot is Ron Bauer. All right. Yeah. Midnight Bourbon, I think is going to be a pretty popular pick, but on the other hand, I, I, I can't see him any worse than the third choice in here with the Baffert horses. So uh, Midnight Bourbon is a horse that makes a lot of sense to me. In fact, he's going to be my long shot pick. Uh, uh, pardon me on the five to one long shot, but uh, I, I, I'm picking a longer horse to win the race. So I think you'll give me uh, uh, that uh, advantage here. I do think Ron Bauer and maybe Unbridled Honor can sneak into the exotics, but the horse I really expect to step up. I think he's talented. I, I think this is the time where he can step up his crowded trade. So I'm going crowded trade. It's my top pick over Midnight Bourbon, my long shot pick. And we're both uh, picking against the two Baffert favorites, Matt. I kind of like that. Yeah. Just to be clear, folks, I am not betting this race because I don't think Baffert's horses should be allowed to be running in the Preakness, especially Medina Spirit. So I am taking a pass on the wagering, but I did my homework handicapping these races. Let's move on, Matt, to the Black Eyed Susan, which is actually the day before, nine furlongs. It's the Philly counterpart to the Preakness. And I have a hard time looking past the Bob Baffert runner, Johnny Velasquez in the saddle. I think beautiful gift, the uh, uh, stakes winner in California, the Santa Isabella winner, and uh, a close second last time in the Santa Anita Oaks. For my money, she uh, she kind of stands over the field. Well, good for you, Brian, picking uh, 
picking the favorite Bob Baffert uh, in the Black Eyed Susan. I'm sorry, I can't do it. I'm going to say right up front, but folks, you're not going to see me picking a Bob Baffert horse. And if that annoys you, Bob Baffert fans, I'm sorry, but my patience is done um, in this particular situation. Regardless of that, Brian, uh, yeah, a uh, uh, beautiful gift, daughter of Medaglia Doro, won the Santa Isabel in California, was second in the Santa Anita Oaks, certainly has a, a nice record, got to come east. Quite frankly, Brian, I think the Phillies, the three-year-old Phillies in the east are much better than what is in California. Okay, so Matt's off beautiful gift. I just think she's the best horse in the race and, and it's my job to handicap the race. So I'm not gonna pick against her just because of who she's trained for. I think she's gonna win this race. That's my honest assessment. Uh, second choice on the morning line is Adventuring Matt. She comes off a win over the uh, Tapita surface over at Turfway Park in the Bourbonette Oaks last time for trainer Brad Cox. Yeah, Adventuring for Brad Cox. That was a nice win in the, in the Bourbonette Oaks as a, as a Brad Cox horse, you know that she's going to take a lot of action at the windows. Yeah, she's the second choice for sure, I think, in here, Matt. She's got some talent. Uh, she ran a good second to Will's Secret before breaking her maiden easily down in New Orleans. So we already know she can handle the dirt. And uh, the last time was the Bourbonette Oaks. I don't think it was a strong uh, uh, prep for this, but uh, she won it nicely. She could be a talented horse and maybe the top threat in my eyes to the favorite. A couple of horses are coming out of the Gazelle, Matt. And of course, the Gazelle winner search results ran very well in the Kentucky Oaks. That's uh, Army Wife, who was third, and the Grass is Blue, uh, Chad Brown runner, who looks to be the third choice on the morning line. She was fourth in that Gazelle. Yeah, you want to? I'm going to start with uh, Army Wife because that is a horse that I like a great deal uh, in this race, listed at 10 to 1 morning line. I'm a guy that. Uh, uh, when I'm handicapping, one of my main factors is, uh, is class, and you've got to respect the third place finish of Army Wife uh, in the Gazelle. That was behind two horses that ran in the Kentucky Oaks. That was behind Search Results, who was second in the Kentucky Oaks, behind the powerful Malathot, and also behind Maracuja was third in that race after having had to check um, at the top of the stretch in there. Army Wife also has- All right, a, Army. Army Wife also has a very nice allowance win at Gulfstream Park um, in her PP's daughter of uh, declaration of war should appreciate the distance. Yeah, Army Wife is a horse, I think, who has a shot as well. I, I, I'm not quite as excited about the Gazelle performance. I know she had some trouble, but I, I just really didn't think uh, the horses behind the top one and then the top two were really that close at any point during the race. She's a very consistent dirt performer. She's a consistent rallier. She should be okay at nine furlongs. An interesting long shot. I think another interesting long shot, Matt, is Miss Leslie. Miss Leslie will probably be disrespected as we saw in the morning line. They had her at 15 to one, which surprised me a little bit, but she's been a stakes horse there in Maryland uh, ever since uh, uh, breaking her maiden. And she's run consistently well with uh, coming from way back. She doesn't have any speed, but her two, two turn stakes events, she got up for the win, including a win over the grass is blue a few starts back. I think she's a, a live long shot here, even though she's the local horse trying tougher as they come in to visit Pimlico. I agree, Brian. I think she is a live long shot because there was always something to be said about uh, uh, racing out of your own stall um, in a big race. Uh, trainer Claudio Gonzalez has won a lot of stake races, uh, um, has won some big races. And, and uh, this, you know, this Philly last time out won the Weber City Miss. Um, after having to get steadied, a real, a real good competitor. I like her too. Weber City Miss Bryant, one of our favorite horses from the 70s. 
Yeah, I, I, I call her Weber City Miss, but uh, I, I always liked her. She turned out to be a very nice broodmare as well, Matt. Uh, a little history there for you. Um, hey, Miss Leslie, she's going to be my long shot pick, Matt. I, I think she is a very interesting horse. I, I hope there's enough speed for her to make her rally, but I think she'll run a race. She's my long shot. As you know, sadly, my top pick is Bafford with Beautiful Gift. I just think she's the class of the race. How about you? My top pick is a long shot, Brian. My top pick is Army Wife. And, and if I was going to be betting, I, I, I like this horse a lot in here. And I agree with you with a long shot pick. I'm going with Miss Leslie also. Well, there you go. Hopefully we're uh, right about this top long shot for both of us. Miss Leslie, the local in the Black Eyed Susan. One race before the Black Eyed Susan on a nice card Friday at Pimlico. Of course, it's the Pimlico special, a race with a lot of history, Matt. Mile three sixteenths, just like the Preakness. Uh, maybe no world beaters in here, but it, it's, it's a nice uh, deep field. I think, though, the clear favorite, uh, he was nine to five on the morning line, is the Pletcher horse, Fearless. Fearless seems to be getting better and better. I like the race he ran last time in the Oaklawn Handicap. I agree with that, Brian. Um, I like that race in the Oaklawn Handicap uh, when uh, the son of Ghost Zapper was second, and it was a second behind the gutsy uh, winner, Silver Strike, who keeps on winning and winning. So no shame in finish second, finishing second to that horse. And before the race at Oaklawn, Fearless was a winner in the Gulfstream Park mile, a grade two. Expect a stalking trip from this Pletcher runner. Yeah, yeah. I, I think he's the clear favorite, and I certainly think he's the horse to beat. I am going to look to beat him, though, Matt. And there's some interesting candidates in here. Uh, we'll start with the second choice on the morning line. That's uh, outside speed, last judgment. Yeah, last judgment for from the barn of Mike Maker was second in the Ghost Zapper and then won the uh, Challenger Stakes a grade three at Tampa. Expect this one to uh, be out there running on the lead. Yeah, speed is always dangerous, even at a mile three sixteenths, or, or maybe sometimes especially when they run longer. And this horse will be on the lead. He's better than ever. Uh, four to one on the morning line, but I really do think he's going to be a little bit higher than that when uh, uh, when the race is run. I, I'm expecting him to be more in the five, six, seven to one range, maybe even. So a, a horse that they'll have to run down. I, I think he gets beat if somebody runs a good race. But on the other hand, if he gets out there and, and none of these horses prove to uh, uh, be strong and ready for this Pimlico special, he certainly could go all the way. Third choice on the morning line is Modernist Matt. He was a stakes winner at three down in New Orleans more than a year ago, but he, recently he came back to win a stakes at, at uh, Aqueduct. Yeah, for Hall of Famer Bill Mott, it was a nice return winning the Excelsior, which is a grade three at Aqueduct. Um, you know, well, wasn't the toughest field in the world, but you know, neither is this one. And for Mott, this is a horse that, uh, could take a step forward and, uh, you know, showed a lot of potential last year. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with that. Modernist is a horse who should like a mile three sixteenths. I'm not sold on just how good he is. And that race at Aqueduct was relatively weak, but a mile three sixteenths should be up his alley. I think there's a, a, a bunch of other horses uh, interesting in here, Matt. We have last year's winner. We also have a, a bunch of horses who ran, uh, in, in some classy races uh, previously in their career. Uh, prioritize, enforceable, max player. Any of those you think are especially dangerous in here? Um, I, you know, I, I, you know, I've had enough with enforceable. He's already had enough tries this year um, to see whether he was going to uh, step forward and uh, that hasn't happened. Like you mentioned, prioritize. Uh, a son of Tisway from the Bond Barn, six-year-old, um, ran in some tough, tough races. And, and I talked about class uh, being important before, was fourth in the Jockey Club Gold Cup last year, was third in the Woodward. And, you know, if uh, he can come up with that kind of performance and feel like this, he could be dangerous. Yeah, dangerous for sure. I, I'm not really on Max Player in here, although I think he does have some class too for Steve Asmussen, but only one race overseas makes me think that he's not going to, that late runner is not going to be at his very best. 
I'm with you on what you said about prioritize. In fact, I think I'm really with you. I, I, I'm going to say Bond, James Bond, has a really live horse in here. I think prioritize when he switched from turf to dirt, you could just see him getting better with every start last year. He likes a distance. You said he's a son of Tisway who is uh, uh, good in races like the Woodward and Jockey Club last year. I think that's going to carry over to this year. Uh, second year, uh, even though despite of his age, this is the second year of running on dirt. I think he's going to be a darn good dirt horse. So I like prioritizing here. But having said that, who's your top pick, Matt? My top pick in here is Fearless. I'm going with Todd Pletcher. Um, I, I like the win at Gulfstream Park. I like the second place behind uh, Silver Strike at Oaklawn Park. And my long shot pick is Last Judgment. Okay, so that's that's one, two on the morning line. But like I said, I think Last Judgment will be a little bit higher uh, than his morning line odds. Uh, you know, Fearless, I, th I just think he's going to be a pretty heavy favorite in here because I don't know who else they're going to really bet. I think Fearless is the horse to beat, but I'm going to try to beat that heavy favorite. I'm going to go with Prioritize, make it his first start of the year for Bond, James Bond. I think Prioritize can win this. Uh, uh, Joel Rosario is hopping aboard a horse who looked pretty darn classy last year. He'll be my top pick as a long shot again. So uh, I'm going with a long shot on top, much like the Preakness. My top long shot then is going to be a horse actually lower on the morning line, last judgment. I'm um, joining Matt there. So I think Tony has all our uh, top picks for the three races and top long shots. Matt, I'm tired as well of everything that's going on racing. I'm only hoping that good things come from this latel, latest scandal, this latest embarrassment, this latest set of lies. What is your parting shot for the week? Yeah, Brian, it needs to change. And, and maybe uh, since... This has happened with the Kentucky Derby winner. Maybe things will change this time. I'm dubious, but if more owners take horses away from Baffert, that's hitting them where it hurts. We shall see. Uh, but again, folks, if you're wagering this weekend, good luck. And as always, I want to thank our great producer, Tony Bada Bing, for everything he does for Horse Center. Yeah, thanks to Tony. Thanks to Candace Curtis for getting us these great race graphics. Thanks for all of you watching. We also want to thank our sponsor, Derby Wars, the best contest site out there. Folks, if you haven't yet subscribed to our uh, YouTube channel here at Horse Racing Nation, I urge you to do so now. It really helps out Matt and I. So please do that for us. Uh, Matt, we will be back next week. I'm sure we'll be talking about more races. We'll be talking about what happened this week at Pimlico. We'll also be talking more about what unfolds in the coming days with the Bob Baffert situation. Join us all next week right here on Horse Center.